America tends to forget its history and its culture artistically. And I think that um, the British have a greater appreciation for our art than we do. There's a great Keith Richards story where he talks about reuniting with Mick Jagger at a train station and uh, Keith followed Mick home because Mick had a stack of American blues records, imports, under his arm. A lot of African-American soldiers were bringing records with them to England when they were stationed there during the war. EMI, one of the first big labels, uh, began releasing blues and jazz through its uh, subsidiary DECA. At first, it was sort of like an underground thing. You didn't do it to be cool. You'll hear stories from Rolling Stones, from Jimmy Page, you know, The Who and whatnot, about bonding and meeting each other over these records. The Beatles were a big part of that scene as well. They were really a blues band, you know, and they were covering American blues artists. In the early 1950s, Skiffle became uh, very popular in England. And here is a song called Mama, what is it? Mama, don't want me to play any Skiffle? No. No, anymore. no more. Skiffle was essentially an art form where you had middle-class white British youth playing revved up versions of American blues and folk songs on homemade and, and low-end instruments. It was like sort of the first garage rock, I suppose. Now then, you're called what? James Page and David Haskell. Jimmy Page, uh, John Lennon, and uh, some of the first Rolling Stones all had skiffle bands. There was an artist named Lonnie Donegan. He's considered the father of skiffle. He had something like 31 top 10 hits in the UK, 24 of them consecutive. And now it's time for us to introduce the king of skiffle himself, Lonnie Donegan. <laughs> and had incredible chart success playing these black American songs. He had a huge impact on the first wave of, of British R&B. He covered the songs of Lead Belly, who was a famous American blues artist. So when uh, Skiffle began to decline and British rock and roll began to emerge and, and R&B and whatnot, um, a lot of artists were listening to imported records from the United States. Jimmy Page spoke about listening to Elvis on a little transistor radio and there was like so much static he said he could barely hear it but he would like tune in every night to try and figure out the song he like, couldn't like record it or anything so that's how hungry they were for like this you know this sound it's something totally new you have to understand that like all of these blues rock musicians you know who later became legends in their own right were drawn from the same gene pool now of course, you know, those guys are influenced by these guys who are influenced by these guys who are influenced by these guys. It begins in America, begins in England. It's like a great give and take between like the American and the English traditions. England sort of preserved the musical tradition that we forgot about and helped us to remember our own culture, considering that blues is the greatest gift that America has given the world, arguably. You'll hear the argument that Elvis and whoever were essentially stealing from this wonderful body of African-American work in the United States. You know, that was music that was reserved for billiard halls and smoky bars and whorehouses. You know, it, wasn't, you know, it wasn't okay. Lonnie Donegan and later Elvis and, and whoever made black music safe for white America. Rock and roll pop music wouldn't exist as it does today because most music is blues based whether people know it or not. Although there was integration of black and white musicians in American jazz and blues, it really took like the British R&B and blues boom to move away from like the separation of black and white music. Mm -hmm. 